I'd just like to draw attention to one panel member we had hoped would be with us tonight, but has uh, is suffering uh, extreme back pain. Is uh, Patrick Brown, Patty Brown, who is a uh, uh, a wonderful veteran photographer who's been based in the region for a long time. He has been covering the Rakhine crisis, but particularly since September over on the Bangladesh side in the camps. He's taken these stunning photographs which um, and has been nominated for a World Press Photo Award, uh, which we'll know fairly soon. It's being judged. Uh, and those photos are going to keep running through on a loop. Uh, there's about a dozen of them, I think. And uh, our thoughts are with Paddy to recover. Um, and then on my far right, we have Jonathan Head, who's just uh, spoken and I think needs no introduction. Uh, but just to point out that Jonathan is one of the few reporters who has uh, been in and out of northern Rakhine State, very difficult thing to do, and uh, has been on uh, one of the few who went on government-sponsored press trips and managed to get like extraordinary scoops and also uh, reports that really showed what some of the manipulation, the falsehoods and uh, the pressures are on journalists covering um, this issue and he will, um, he will be talking to us about that. Next is Poppy McPherson who's been reporting in this region based in Myanmar uh, for uh, five years and has produced very powerful pieces on the Rohingya exodus for The Guardian, Time magazine, and is now based in Bangkok. She's doing a, a book on the Rohingya crisis, um, but also, I think, with her special insights of living consistently in Myanmar for five years, she's got a uh, very good um, take on the sort of mindset that uh, once you're in this country, um, how different the perspective is operating as a journalist inside, as a foreign journalist. Uh, next to her is uh, John Reed um, uh, of the Financial Times, my um, successor, plus two, who uh, moved from Jerusalem to Bangkok last year to take up the post of regional correspondent for the FT. John is an absolute veteran journalist of many countries and speaks more languages than uh, most people I know and uh, recently wrote a searing uh, insightful report on the changing perspective of the media in Myanmar and how the world views the country and uh, he'll um, focus on those kind of impressions. And finally, Matthew Tostevin, uh, another veteran journalist for Reuters and currently bureau chief in Bangkok, uh, previously spent much of his career in Africa and is going to talk about uh, the most high profile case uh, I, you've all heard of, um, I'm sure, the jailing, the arrest and jailing of two uh, Reuters journalists, uh, both Burmese um, in uh, Myanmar and who are now on trial and the issues it has raised and how Reuters sees their mission and, um, and perhaps uh, talk about, explain Reuters principles. So. Without further ado, um, you've uh, read uh, the theme of the night. It focuses on the challenges and pressures of reporting on this um, uh, really um, severe crisis. And I think I should just say that the idea for the evening came out of all our inspirations and admiration that came from a very brave report by Hannah Beach of the New York Times. Um, who has been consistently vilified by the Myanmar government for her very brave reports um, uh, from the Rohingya side uh, of the refugee exodus. But then um, in a very balanced uh, report pointed out also that it's become very difficult sometimes in those refugee camps to um, ascertain truth from, from uh, distortions and fabrications or exaggerations when you're trying to record the stories of these Rohingya refugees and what really happened. And for that, she's, uh, she's um, been lambasted by a lot of human rights groups and, uh, of course, is now a hero with the Myanmar government. But that won't last for long um, because she's a good journalist. So um, <laughs> I'll, just, uh, I'll just keep uh, move on here. And uh, we'll start with you, Jonathan. Over Thanks, to you. Very Thanks very much, Gwen. Um, I know I've sat at this table many times, but this is an issue that's close to my heart. Um, I think it, it is a, a fact that in the modern media age, um, with the enormous impl 
influence of social media that we as mainstream journalists must uh, explain ourselves better. Uh, we have to explain what we do, we have to explain where we get things right and where we get them wrong and admit that sometimes th thing we do get things wrong. Um, Hannah Beach's piece, as Gwen was uh, referring to it, I thought was very important and very courageous. Uh, I was so glad that she did it. It's been on my mind many times. Uh, and I've had the same experiences that she's had where I've been sometimes talking to people for whom you have immense sympathy who are telling you very, very painful stories that are powerful uh, and compelling uh, to put into your reports. And you do find out later, not very often, but sometimes you find out that they weren't true. And it's often very difficult to check. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, often happens in my business, because I'm filing mostly video television reports, is you know, we're trying to pull together material under enormous time deadlines. Um, I think particularly of working in Cox's Bazaar, um, in the, the camps where all the Rohingya refugees are now. Uh, and quite often, you go out in the morning, you're dealing with horrific traffic because the roads can't cope uh, with the amount of you know, all the aid trucks going in. It's a, it, all the logistics are overstressed. Uh, it can take you a very long time to get somewhere, and you have to pull together enough material that's been videoed and edited to put out in that evening's news, news bulletin. You find someone who's got a really powerful story to tell you. How are you going to check it? Um, one of my colleagues, uh, Gabriel Gatehouse, who's an outstanding journalist, did a piece for our Newsnight program, which is the BBC's long current affairs program, in November, where he investigated the massacre at a village called Tulatoli. It's been quite extensively covered. The Guardian has, CNN's mentioned it. But it was a, a master, it was much longer format than a normal news piece, but it was a masterpiece in how to cross-check. He was looking at maps and getting people to explain what had happened so that they could show exactly where things were. He was cross-checking with what other people said. He was able even to phone up a village administrator inside Rakhine State who had been actually seen it happen and acknowledged what had happened to confirm the accounts he was being given. But so often we can't do that. And sometimes, quite inadvertently, uh, we as journalists you know, do end up reporting things that turn out to be inaccurate. Now, that sucks or gets fed into the immediate debate that you'll be hearing a huge amount about now, about the so-called fake news, which is a term that we've all agreed we hate. Um, it's obviously been misappropriated by a number of people, not least the President of the United States, as a way of basically demonizing anything you don't like. There is such a thing as fake news. Social media has allowed people to place reports that masquerade and appear to be authentic, uh, properly researched reports and turn out to be deliberately false. Now, that I would call fake news, but it's being used for a whole range of categories, and it's becoming, I mean, as we've seen, Malaysia's just passed a law where they can imprison you for 10 years for uploading anything which they say is even partially false, um, an extraordinary and sweeping law. So we do need, it's very important, I think, uh, to make sure a distinction is made between professional journalists whose intention is to do the, the most uh, thorough and, and accurate reporting they can, who do sometimes make errors and who, who try to correct them, uh, which is just part of our business. It happens. Um, and I will refer here to a, a, a very brave colleague, uh, Esther Toussaint, who's actually in the audience here, who is the bureau chief for uh, AP, the Associated Press. And when uh, her, her reporting last year made a, a fairly quite small error about a speech from, uh, by Aung San Suu Kyi, and you have to translate all the time. It was fairly quickly corrected by AP, but she was demonized for it by people supporting the Myanmar government to such an extent that she's been hounded out of the country and really can't go back there at the moment. Uh, so it's, it's a very poisonous term, this fake news, and it's being used quite often to discredit good journalists trying to do a good job. Now, when I was in Rakhine State last year um, on a government tour, so we were supposed to be given a very sanitized view very soon, it was literally within two weeks of the attacks which had set off the violence, um, I was, uh, we were told then by the military, um, and they kept up this account even, even now, that all the villages being burnt down were being burnt down by the Rohingyas themselves, or being encouraged to do it by Rohingya militants before they voluntarily fled over the border to Bangladesh, supposedly to get all the aid that was on offer there. Um, obviously, everything we've heard from the refugees is a, is a horribly different account of, of the most extraordinary brutality. But the Myanmar government kept up that account. Uh, now, while we were being accused by Aung San Suu Kyi and her government of distorting the news, of being far too favorable to Rohingyas, 
uh, and indeed of putting out fake news, as often they said that, I was actually given, um, while I was in, uh, on a very short trip in M near Mongdor, a series of photographs which purported to show Muslims, Rohingyas, burning down their own homes to support their, their narrative. Uh, at the same time, we were taken, one of the first places we were taken was to a school with displaced Hindus in it, all of whom were under government control and told us stories about how awful the, the, the Muslims had been to them. Uh, and I only found out afterwards, because it was a mad rush, that in fact um, the Muslims that uh, uh, were supposedly burning down the village were in fact the Hindus dressed up. I'm just going to show you a short video. It's, not, it's only a couple of minutes long, but I'll talk you through it as we see this. So this is the, the school we went to. I wasn't paying a lot of attention because it was so controlled. I didn't think anybody could speak. Look at the man in the back there with the check shirt. And look at this woman here. She had a very sad tale to tell about what Muslims had done to her home. And just one brief moment, because I wasn't filming it that seriously. I didn't think I'd use it. My camera goes down. You get to see her clothing quite clearly. It was only uh, probably an hour and a half or two hours later that we were given these photographs from someone's phone, um, someone working with the authorities down there. Look at the clothes. Now, these are supposedly Muslims, although the woman appears to have a tea towel on her or a tablecloth on her head. Um, there she is, um, a Muslim burning down her own home, supposedly. Um, um, and th there's a whole series of these photographs. Interestingly, they didn't give them to me. They gave them to my Burmese colleagues. Um, the trip was almost entirely Burmese journalists. And these were then immediately reported on mainstream Burmese media as proof that Muslims were indeed burning down their homes. So there he is. You can have a look at him again. Look at his shirt. Look at his face. Um, it is very, very clearly the same guy. I mean, it's extraordinary that they got these guys, these people, these two people, to fake the photographs and couldn't even get them a change of clothes. Um, and there you are. See, that's him coming back from burning down the house, supposedly a Muslim doing it. Now, when these... these um, uh, photographs went out, uh, there was an immediate response from the government saying this was absolute proof that what they were saying was true. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to spool it on a little bit because I don't think actually I need to prove any more to you than that because uh, you can very clearly look at the bangles on her arms and you'll see um, uh, when I, there's a still I can show you later on of her where you'll see exactly the same bangles, two on each arm. Um, so th there's one there. Anyway, shortly after this, I'll just move it on a little bit. Uh, there, you can see the bangles there. The um, spokesman for Aung San Suu Kyi put this tweet out. Now, he has removed it. I'll move it back there. He's removed this now, but there we go. Think about it. It's the truth. So the government was, was promoting this stuff as though it was true. Um, I mean, I'll give him credit. The next day, he started to have doubts, and he did remove the tweet. But the um, editor of the largest media group... Um, in Myanmar, Lev Media, came onto my Facebook page my, when I uh, posted the photographs and attacked me for even suggesting they could possibly be the same people. And he's trying to suggest that somehow these clothes are different. Um, his media reported these photographs very widely as absolute proof that Muslims were burning down their own homes. So, you know, there has this is the sort of thing that is going on. Now, you know, we can all laugh. The Myanmar government is not very good at, at this, and, and they were caught out. I don't even think those photographs <coughs> were put out by the government. I think it was a local initiative. I don't think the local authorities in Northern Rakhine State knew that journalists were going to come. It was very organized in a very hasty way. They were sticking to this line. I think they just rushed to get something together that might somehow convince us uh, of this line that Muslims were burning their own homes down. Plenty of governments in this region are a great deal more sophisticated, and I would p pick out the Philippines government in particular, running social media campaigns that harass journalists, try to discredit them, discredit opposition. Um, it, 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 there is an information war going on out there, uh, and we are sucked into that, and we have to deal with it. And I'll wrap it up there. Thanks, Jonathan. That's uh, a lot of food for thought. And uh, I should have said, we'll allow plenty of time for questions afterwards, so um, you know, any of the themes that are brought up, you feel free to ask away. But uh, for now, over to you, Poppy, and uh, um, how you see um, the various issues. Yeah, so I moved to Myanmar in 2015, um, and it was an era of intense optimism. It, it was, we, we were being told that this was the transition 
everything was changing and everything a lot was changing. Uh, I was writing stories about how the price of SIM cards had dropped from $2,000 to $200, uh, about the restoration of heritage buildings. Um, a lot of, there was a big, there was a lot of optimism in the air. Uh, but the Rohingya crisis was, was kind of festering in the background. We all knew what was going on there, but a lot of people tried to sort of ignore it, uh, pretend it wasn't going on, including, including diplomats in, in the, not pretending, but playing it down to kind of feed this narrative. Um, and I first flew there in the summer of that year, 2015, uh, and I visited the camps in, in Sitwe, outside of Sitwe, uh, where tens of thousands of people were living in extremely squalid conditions, um, miserable, not allowed to work, not allowed to travel. Uh, it was, you know, it is, continues to be an atrocious situation. Um, and that somebody, somebody sort of said to me then, um, if we had weapons, then we would fight for our rights. Um, and at the time, I thought maybe it was a possibility in 10 years. And then, in fact, the next year, um, that's exactly what happened. We saw the formation of the Rohingya militant movement um, who attacked police posts across northern Rakhine state, prompting this enormous army crackdown. And then the next year, the big, bigger version of that occurred. And that was when I started flying between Myanmar and Bangladesh um, and kind of reporting on from both sides of the border, which was difficult because we were faced with this situation of flying to Bangladesh, hearing these stories, and then coming back to Myanmar where we were vilified by the government, a lot of local people, um, as producing fake news. Um, so I thought I'd tell a short story um, to try and sort of sum up a few uh, of the points I'm I want to make about the idea that we're producing fake news. Um, in, in September last year, I flew to Cox's Bazaar and I was interviewing a lot of the refugees coming over. There were thousands upon thousands of people streaming over the border. And one day I, I went to an abandoned, or a, a schoolhouse that had been requisitioned to um, cater for refugees. And I, s I met this woman and she was um, a very striking woman, middle, middling height, um, she was dressed in a hijab. She had these eyes that were red raw. She'd been crying for probably days. And she said to me um, that her uncle had been taken a few days before. Her uncle had been taken out under the pretext of, of going to a meeting by some Myanmar soldiers. And then he was, he was taken to some field and he was um, beheaded along with some other men and his grave was dug in front of him. And then she, she told me this and then she introduced me to another woman who, um, who backed up the story. And I wrote the story down, I, I noted it, but it was one of dozens of stories that I'd heard that day. So, so I didn't really follow up on it. Um, it kind of lay in the back of my notebook for a while. And then it, what, what it turned out, these women were from Indin, which is a village which I didn't really, hadn't really heard of at the time. And I was asking around, you know, if anything else had happened in that village. And I didn't hear any similar stories, so I didn't, I didn't follow up on it. And then, of course, that village was the village which was then the subject of a Reuters investigation that really blew the lid on the whole situation in Northern Rakhine State. They had Buddhist civilians admitting to the murders. They had soldiers. They had police um, admitting to their I involvement in this. Um, and so what's the point of that story? I'm, I'm trying to say that there's just, trying to stress the magnitude of stories that are coming out. You know, that was just one story which, which turned out to be true. And if Reuters hadn't followed up on it, if they hadn't picked up that story, then, then it, it could have never been uncovered. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's so many, there are hundreds of villages that have been raised, hundreds of thousands of refugees. I think that we're actually really only scratching the surface of what happened. Um, and the second point is that, you know, Myanmar says that we kind of try to portray that we go to Bangladesh, we hear people's stories, and we report anything anybody tells us. Um, and that's just not true. You know, we have, we try and verify the stories as best we can, which isn't always completely possible because we can't get to northern Rakhine State. But it's a process. We, we try and find multiple stories, we try and get government confirmation, and if we can't, a lot of the times the stories simply 
rest in the back of our notebooks. They, they never go, come to light. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's not the case that we're uh, sort of repeating any, anything anyone says to us. Um, so I don't know, I think that the situation is looking rather bleak at the moment, but I, I do think that we should be inspired by the example of, of the Reuters journalists. I mean, they, despite all the challenges of reporting in Northern Rakhine, they managed to kind of, they managed to get something which is in, incontrovertible evidence. And um, yeah, you know, we, we should kind of look to that and try and copy that example and, and you know, do our best to <laughs> not end up in jail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks very much, uh, Poppy. I, I think also you, you raised an issue which hopefully we can uh, uh, look at again, which is uh, also the difficulty of verification, um, and that extends to journalists as well, and um, I mean photographers as well, because <laughs> the images out of this, as you have seen by Patty's uh, photos, are so powerful, but photographers in particular are just shooting. They're, they're in the middle of a camp, they're like shooting photos they often have no choice but to take on face value, you know, her name, she was 30, she was raped by 10 soldiers, this and that, she saw her family killed before her eyes, and you move on. So I think the verification thing has become um, a particularly fraught issue for um, journalists. But John, I think you're going to look at the theme of your excellent uh, long piece recently, which also looks at the, the Burmese side and the, and the whole propaganda war and the bitterness that has um, arisen yeah, over that. Yeah, thanks, Glenn. I wanted to, I'm nowhere near as experienced as either Jonathan or Poppy in covering this region. Sorry, I've been here all of six months. Um, I wanted to start out by making a general point that journalism is getting harder to do. It's in deep trouble everywhere. That social media changes absolutely everything. Um, uh, the whole fake news trope. Um, uh, is being brought up by absolutely everybody. Uh, our facts are checked in real time, we're trolled constantly, and access is getting poor. People are questioning the role of journalism itself. So that's sort of the starting point for covering anything, anywhere, uh, much less Myanmar. Um, a bit about myself, um, as Gwen mentioned, I covered Israel-Palestine before coming here, um, which reminds me a bit of covering Myanmar uh, with some important differences. It's also a poisonous um, ethnic conflict, ethnic and national conflict with a religi religious background. It's also a place where um, our reports, if anything, got scrutinized um, down to the word, down to the comma. Um, and um, the difference though, if anything, what's harder in Myanmar is that the government is not engaging. That as Jonathan says, the, the PR machine is not very well oiled. So there's typically nobody on the other side of the phone. If you want to, if you want to get the other side, which I think is lacking in many of our reports um, lately, there's no one to pick up the phone. The visa regime is getting harder for journalists who want to go in. Um, you now have to present them with a detailed itinerary of all of your movements, everybody you're going to interview, uh, weeks or even months ahead of time. Which I don't know of any journalist who can honestly do that. Um, uh, so it's getting more and more, it's just getting more and more difficult to, to do things in Myanmar. I didn't want to turn this into an extended whine, um, yeah. and I was kind of, you know, I always have some questions about events like these where it's like, poor journalists. I think we have to get back to our duty to tell the story and to uh, serve our readers or, or viewers. And I was going to make a couple of, I won't call them suggestions, I wouldn't presume, but thoughts for discussion, um, things from my notebook about how do you cover a conflict? How do you cover a story where a lot of the sources are not cooperating with you, where you might not be able to get into the country? Um, and indeed, the country might close itself down for foreign journalists. We don't know. Uh, it's a possibility. Um, so one, obviously, we need to rely more on third-party sources, um, international agencies like the UN, NGOs, um, like MSF. Um, MSF did some uh, very interesting um, exercise where they tried to count how many people, um, how many Rohingyas had died a natural deaths during the, during the exodus or the ethnic cleansing, or whatever you want to call it. Um, the danger with this, as I discovered from my work in Africa, of relying too much on an NGO or indeed on the UN is that you need to fact check them as well. They sometimes get stuff wrong. They always have an agenda, including the UN. 
And I just don't think we're doing our readers a lot of service when we do a lazy, um, a lazy report based on one NGO finding or press release. And we have to do a lot better than that. But that's one source we can, we can go to. Um, another is open source data. I think we need to be more resor resourceful in just looking at what's out there in the public sphere. And I think we all forget this. I mean, I always forget this, that when you think you've got a story, you went and talked to a few people, um, you forget that there's this whole backstory and history out there that you might be able to add to by reading a book, um, by looking at some of the new tools we can get online in terms of um, in terms of maps, publicly available data, reverse engineering of images. I mean, there's a whole world out there. Uh, my media organization, the FT, has training in these things, which I've, I've taken up gladly. Um, Reuters and AP did extraordinary things with, um, with satellite footage from Rakhine, where northern Rakhine, which we've all been locked out of for how many months now. So there's stuff that can, got, can be gotten in the public sphere. Um, Another, th another thought I've been having is that we need to be more creative and resourceful about doing work over the phone uh, or Skype or whatever communications methods we, we have with people who are in northern Rakhine or who are in Burma if we can't get into Burma proper either. Um, and we can't just sort of fold our arms and say, well, I couldn't get there and I couldn't get the story. We have to, we have to go and find it. And I learned this from my colleague, um, one of my best colleagues, Erica Solomon in Beirut, Beirut who was covering the Syrian civil war at a time. I mean, Syria was off limits for reporters for about four years there entirely. And she did some amazing stuff and won prizes uh, debriefing people over Skype and sometimes doing it in the middle of the night because that's when Syrian rebels, I don't know, chill out and, and smoke and, and talk on Skype. Um, my other suggestion, this might be controversial. This is, uh, I'm gonna risk sounding like Aung San Suu Kyi here. I think we need to have more context in our stories. I think it's lacking. I think the, the broader Myanmar context is lacking. And I actually think we're all missing some of the bigger stories now around Myanmar's transition, uh, around the economy, which uh, is going in a bad direction and affects everything, and indeed affected the situation in Rakhine. Um, we need to write with more sophistication um, about business, international relations, um, and indeed other ethnic conflicts that aren't getting covered at all, where people are dying. And you know, again, th these are places we can't get access to, but we can write the stories if we want to. Um, I know we have Esther and a, quite a few other people from Myanmar in the audience, so I hope I won't take much more time, um, but I hope this comes up in the questions. Um, and my final suggestion, thought, or whatever, this is actually a suggestion. Um, I think if you're in news reporting, I think if we're in news reporting, we should not emote uh, we should not lecture, we should not preach. We shouldn't really have opinions. I mean, we can have opinions. I think we should be very careful about what we say on social media. I think we should stick to facts, which I always try and do on social media. Um, and when we make mistakes, as Jonathan says, we need to correct them very quickly and publicly. Um, otherwise, we're doing all of us a disservice, starting with ourselves. Um, yeah. Um, that's kind of what I had to say. I, I hope we can talk well, about this more in the Thanks, discussion. John, but if I may just uh, also say, because I mentioned your um, uh, very impressive report on that actually tackled this other issue, which you haven't really sort Sorry. of tackled head on, which is, I think, the, the big divide between, like, you know, particularly Myanmar media or a lot of the domestic right. media in Myanmar and foreign journalists. So this huge resentment right. and bitterness. But do you think that, do you feel, uh, you, you obviously felt enough that it was enough of an issue that you did that, that piece. Do you find that, you know, this right. is actually a huge pressure on foreign journalists and uh, possibly Burmese journalists, you know, you almost feel like a traitor if you're going to take a show as Rohingya in a symp sympathetic right. Ra light. And I think foreign journalists feel traitorous if they're going to question a, a Rohingya's, you know, um, experience or, or stories. I mean, you right. obviously felt you needed to do that. So do you feel that um, there's issues there in, um, in the sort of um, pressures to kind of propagandize or I stick to the line? I don't think there's pressure to propagandize. I was going to kind of address that point a different way, is that I think we need to listen to it. 
Um, I think Myanmar media is becoming a less, this was the other difference I meant to mention with Israel. Israel has a terrific free press, which can actually be a source of tips um, and ideas for stories, and it does a better job than any of the foreign correspondents do. Um, this is not the case with Myanmar, uh, where the media is kind of um, putting it politely, taking a more nationalist line. Um, that said, I think we need to listen to it. I think we need to, I think we need to reflect these views in our stories. I think we need to, I learned this in the Holy Land, we need to talk to people who are openly hostile to us um, and angry at what we've been writing, and we need to put them in our stories. Um, they're well, you certainly did that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, Matthew, so last but not least, um, yeah. the view from Reuters. Yeah, no, well, well, well thanks very much. And, and um, obviously, a, a, as much as, as possible, I'll also be trying to, sort of represent the views of Wallon and Chosu, um, who are, would have been much better at being able to articulate, much better at being able to talk about what drives them, much better at being able to sort of describe the situation and challenges of working in, of working in Myanmar than, than I am, but unfortunately were back in court today um, for, their, for their 12th visit, rather than being able to sort of come and explain things. So I will try as best as I can um, to be able to set things out from their perspective and, uh, and so on as well. Could you briefly perhaps remind people of the case, like very, very briefly, timing, what the story was, why they were arrested? A absolutely. Um, so Wallon and Chosu, and I hope, uh, I hope everyone here has had a chance to, to read the story that they were working on they were when they were arrested, which, which Poppy referred to as well. Um, the story of a, of a massacre at in Din, um, not long after the, the latest sort of wave of fighting and things had begun. Um, it's a story that they'd been working on for several months before they were arrested, speaking to people, speaking to people from the different sides, um, speaking to uh, the Rakhine villagers, speaking to the army, speaking to the police, really trying very hard to verify everything they could to make sure that they'd nailed down those facts, to make sure that what they were reporting was the absolute opposite of fake news. It was, it was really a piece that would be able to tell what was happening, a, 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 as Poppy was describing as well, um, dispassionately, accurately, fairly, uh, looking at the different sides. Um, now, on December the 12th, they went to a uh, meeting with some police sources who'd, uh, who'd called them to that meeting. Um, at that meeting, according to what they told their families, um, they were handed documents um, which they weren't even able to look at at the, uh, at, at, at the meeting. Um, the police said, don't worry, take them with you. You can look at them in your own time. Um, as they left the venue, they were arrested immediately. Um, we weren't able to see them in, in public for weeks. Um, before they were brought to court and then charged with the Official Secrets Act, um, which could mean that they spend up to 14 years in prison uh, if they're found guilty of, of possessing uh, official secrets uh, for these documents, which they say they'd never actually seen. Um, so they've now been detained for 15 weeks. Um, today was their 12th appearance in court. Um, their lawyers today moved to have the case dismissed on the basis that the evidence that's presented so far in the court um, doesn't in, in, in any way um, justify the case. Um, the lawyers as well pointed out discrepancies and things which have appeared, discrepancies such as the police accounts, the police witnesses who've disagreed with each other, um, differing police accounts on where the arrests happened, um, the police officer who said he'd burned his notes, which is why he didn't have a, th which he had a, a different recollection to others. The police officer who acknowledged in court that the secrets, the supposed official secrets contained in the documents had actually been published already um, in uh, Myanmar media. Um, and another recent witness who um, needed to have written his notes on his hand so that he could sort of testify properly in, in court, as well as sort of lacking a basic knowledge of procedure and things. So we're confident that the court will certainly demonstrate their innocence and are hopeful, of course, um, that they would be able to be 
released to be able to, to, to carry on their work. That's certainly what they want to be able to do. Um, I've got a little um, quote, actually, from, from Wallone today at, at the court, because obviously, as, as we all know, Myanmar's got a new president today. Um, so if I can just read this out. We are now in insane prison because we covered the news. We're facing the court because we found out about unjust things. I believe that the newly elected president will care about democracy, press freedom, and justice for us. I would like to ask him to bring a solution to this unfair arrest and to give the media its freedom. Um, that's from Wallone. That's what he was saying to, uh, to, to journalists at the, the court today um, for the latest appearance. They've, the, the journalists have been immensely strong, Wallone and Chosu, um, not just in the, uh, in the detention, of course, but uh, in the reporting that they were doing. Um, they and, and their families have, have obviously have uh, sort of suffered as a result. I mean, we've heard from the other panelists as well about the difficulties of being able to find and verify the right sources. Um, the difficulties of being able to um, find people that you can trust. The difficulties of reporting in an environment um, which is often so polarized and where the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, uh, the opinions are, are, are very much not or, or sort of all in the direction of reporting the truth. Um, and again, the importance of not having opinions. Now those things, I think, all of those things, if you look at all of them, they were the things which really sort of helped to exemplify what Wallone and Cho Su-woo were doing in their work, what they were doing as Reuters journalists. And of course, it's, it's how we as Reuters journalists want to work around the world. It's what we aim to do, it's what we aspire to do, is to report always with that, the, the dedication and the integrity and the freedom from bias and the accuracy. Um, and that's, of course, what they were doing when they were arrested, was trying to pin down those facts. And that's what's driven them. That's what's, um, that, that's what's always uh, kept them going in their work. Um, and um, I I again and again, through the trips that they were making, um, through trying to find the sources, through the the incredible photographs that they were able to ob obtain from people, um, for the the testimony that they were able to sort of get from the uh, from the the, the different um, uh, from from the different parties to what had happened at Indin, um, and it's a real tragedy, of course, not only that they've been uh, arrested, um, not only that they're not able to sort of cover that story at the moment, but they're not able to carry out the work that they were. Um, that they're dedicated to doing. Um, and we heard earlier about, we're from John was mentioning about the importance of being able to cover things like the economy, um, to be able to cover things like the, um, to be able to cover things like the other conflicts which were taking place around Myanmar. That's exactly what Wallon would be doing. That's exactly what he was doing before. Um, and that's exactly what we are going to get back to. We, we are doing and we will get back to doing and we hope that they will get back to doing as, as, as soon as we possibly can. Um, we as Reuters are certainly um, as committed as ever to making sure that we cover Myanmar in all those different perspectives. Um, the Rohingya crisis is, is something that we've, that we've covered from the beginning. We're covering it in now in Myanmar. We'll cover it in Bangladesh. Um, We'll, we'll keep covering it as best as we can. Um, of course, we owe it to Wallone and Cho Su now to make sure that we're covering those things as effectively as we can too, um, because they're journalists who believe very much in, in the truth um, and, and, in and, and believe in the importance of getting out the truth on stories which matter for Myanmar, their country, um, as, as well as for the world and are of, are of, of huge public interest. Um, so as I say, I mean, that's something that we're going to, to keep on doing and we hope that as soon as possible, um, Wallone and Cho Su will be back with us and able to do that themselves and able to do that with the same sort of spirit of, of integrity, um, of freedom from bias and of, of, of a willingness and desire to seek the truth and, and tell that truth to the world that got them into the position they're in at the moment. Um, thanks very much for that. Matthew, if you finish. Yeah, and I, I would actually just like to add, having covered Myanmar for eight years now, that a lot of my, I think the, the people at the most difficult 
point stuck in the middle between this deeply, increasingly bitter divide between Western media takes and Burmese media takes are the locals who work for Western media. And that's also, I think, often around the world. Um, but particularly in, in Myanmar now, the uh, local Myanmar journalists who, who work for Western media are often seen as sellouts or traitors to the cause. And so they're, they're actually in a, a far more perilous position. And as we've seen with um, your colleagues, Matthew, they're often the ones who are you know, easily arrested or intimidated or you know, their families are at risk, whereas foreign journalists fly in and out and, and um, you know, they also work for the same organisation perhaps. But I think the, the locals, do you feel that Reuters, um, uh, you know, around the world, I suppose, you're using um, local journalists well, and uh, they do go into the same situations that foreigners do? Well, I mean, most Reuters journalists are what you would call local journalists. Most Reuters journalists are reporting on their own countries. Um, and yes, I mean, Myanmar is not the only is not the only country where there are difficulties. There are there are lots of difficulties um, in the within this region and of course in others as well. Um, and and for all of them, I mean, it, it's that it's that dedication to sticking by those standards that as much as possible protects them as well um, as to making sure that they're looking for the facts. Um, they're not writing opinion. Um, they're not reporting for one side or the other. They're not lobbyists. They're not activists. They're reporters who want to make sure that we're getting out the truth, that we're getting it out fairly, uh, that we're getting it out accurately, um, and that we're able to tell those stories. And, and, and that's, how we, that's how we operate. That's how we have to operate everywhere. That's what we're, that's what we're dedicated to doing. Right. Thank you. Um, before I open the floor to questions, I, I'd just like to maybe bring up one more issue, which, Jonathan, you touched on uh, in our earlier conversation today about this panel. But, uh, um, you know, there's another element here, which is the actual audiences for every type of media, but um, particularly now in Western media, I think, there's such a huge... Uh, um, reaction, quite rightly, to the horrors and atrocities that we've seen on TV screens and read about in papers. Do you feel that, uh, do, you know, I'd like to ask any of you, but uh, maybe start with you, Jonathan, do you feel that um, actually we're kind of, in a way, victims of our own audiences, just like Myanmar media is, which is, um, you know, it is extremely unpopular to say, run a story that, you know, you you're interviewing a bunch of Rohingya who are making their stories up and probably, you know, et cetera. Um, it angers people. There's, a, uh, there's actually a demand, I think, for these very strong stories and photographs and images and TV footage, as you well know. You, you can't go to a refugee camp or to a, a raised Rohingya village without coming back with, you know, the, the worst stories and the the heart-rending stories. So do you feel that's its own kind of pressure, the audience that wants yes, that? Yes, it is. Um, it's not just the audience, it's the editors. Um, <laughs> and uh, Yeah, let's have a go at editors. Well I agree with that. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I really I totally agree with what John has just, say, uh, just said, you know, that as journalists we have to resist being emotional, and yet how can you not be emotional when you hear some of these stories? I mean, I, I freely admit to being in floods of tears sometimes when I'm talking to people, I, it, and then I'm seared by it, it stays with me for weeks. How can you not put that into your reporting? Uh, the other thing is that the, the, the Rohingya story I is of a different dimension in some ways to others, and, and this, is, this presents us with a very big dilemma. We cover uh, stories where nasty things happen and where people do dreadful things and where people suffer quite often, uh, and mostly you can do a professional job, shit happens, your job is to report it, to give a voice to people, but to balance it out, hear all sides, <coughs> get it out there and let people make their own minds up. One of the things I said, and Esther will remember this because she was with me on this government trip that I went on, was there we were on the 6th of uh, September, so just a few days after the violence had started, um, one of only two tours allowed in, on a, uh, and, and no one else was getting into Northern Rakhine State. And we knew by then these horrific stories were coming out from the refugees who'd fled across to Bangladesh. Uh, and I said, not just to Esther, but all the journalists, I said, look, you know, 
we're reporters. Our job is just to report what we see. But we've got a bigger, more, bigger responsibility. It's quite possible something truly dreadful has happened here. And we have to bear witness. We have to bear witness to something that may well end up being a crime against humanity. And we won't necessarily be allowed to see much. In fact, as it happens, we were able to, s well, we happened to see a lot more than they expected us to, and it became a bit of an issue. But uh, we didn't think we'd see much. And, but I said, we, we have to try to see behind what we're, they're showing us. And I've explained to friends of mine in Myanmar as well, I've said, look, you know, every country in Southeast Asia has bad things going on. Human rights get abused. And, and it's part of what goes on here. And we deal with it every day. What we understand and what we're hearing has happened in Northern Rakhine State is of a different order. You're dealing with a, a human rights crisis, the biggest one certainly since East Timor in 1999. In this region, on a scale, you're talking about like the, 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 the tr Bosnian Civil War, Rwanda, something on that scale. Um, I, I hesitate ever to make any parallels with Nazi Germany, but in the end, all journalists you know, recognize that some stories are so big they're a bit more than just a reporter. They're bearing witness, and they're actually seeking truth, and seeking a particular truth in many, many cases. And it has been very, very hard to detach ourselves um, from the horrors that we're hearing. My own editors keep getting on to me about Rakhine and about Rohingya. They say, you cannot believe how horrified people in Britain are. They are utterly appalled that this could be happening at all with a country with which Britain has normal relations, but of course, in particular, because a country led by Aung San Suu Kyi, who they led to believe was this champion of human rights. And it has been very hard to escape that pressure. Mm. And you would be taking a very contrary view if you stood up and said, it's kind of that you know, moral equivalence. Well, but the other guys have got a point too. It's a very difficult line. As journalists, we're often sort of accused, and particularly on the Rakhine story, we're accused by the government of favoring too much the Rohingyas. And partly that's because they're the only people we can talk to because we can't get into Rakhine State, and that does unbalance things. And we are, and John's really made a good point, that we're very conscious of that. Um, but it's also because, you know, the, 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 a lot of the Burmese are saying to me, well, why aren't you drawing attention to what's happened to Rakhine people? They've suffered too. And they're right, some Rakhine people have. And, no and certainly some Rohingyas have committed atrocities against Rakhine. But the, the scale, remember Donald Trump and, and, and the march in Charlottesville where he tried to make a moral equivalence between neo-Nazis marching and the people on the other side. As a journalist, you're supposed to be completely neutral. But actually, and I've often <coughs> explained this to governments, is that we, being neutral doesn't mean you know, doing 50% criticism of you and then 50% support. It means weighing up what we hear about a story and deciding where we think the line fairly is. And in the case of Rakhine State, everything we hear I, is of a, a historic crime against humanity that has been deliberately carried out by the Burmese military. Now, they may not see it that way, and certainly Burmese people mm. don't see it that way. Mm. But if, and certainly the evidence points to that, if that's what's happened, then as journalists, we can't pretend there's somehow a middle line between what the Rohingyas are saying and what the government's saying. You know, something yeah. truly morally repugnant has, has happened. It is a difficulty with as journalists because we are supposedly above it all. Right, but that's a moral judgment, and I suppose in Myanmar... A dilemma, and, uh, I think, as much as a judgment. Often in uh, Myanmar, mm. there are certain mm. uh, journalists and editors who will make the decision that it's not at all morally repugnant, and it sort of <laughs> fits with what they, you know... There's but that but only, frankly, well. by denying... I, I, yeah. I think that's the point. The only... Plenty of people in Myanmar are trying to downplay what's happened, but they can only do that by shutting their eyes. You, you cannot, as a, as a sentient, rational human being, look at the weight of testimony coming out of Rohingyas. You know, we, we, all of us, and that includes people who work for the UN as well and aid agencies, have had experience of going to places where you're hearing a lot of testimony. And, and you know, y some of it's wrong. And some people make stuff up. And Rohingyas do make stuff up sometimes. They're people who have been victims for generations and have learned sometimes to embellish stories where they think it will help them. That is a fact, and it does happen. But you cannot, l just look at some of the testimony, look at the state of the people who are giving it. And this testimony has been given time after time after time in, pla in different locations stretched across more than 100 kilometers in dozens of different camps over weeks and weeks and weeks. People coming across telling the same stories of the most horrific shocking human rights abuses deliberately carried out against them. You can't wipe that away. And the only way, frankly, that, that editors in Myanmar can somehow downplay it is simply by shutting their eyes to it. Right. And it, it, 
one can add that, as all of you know, when you're sitting in Yangon, you would never know that there's a place called Rakhine and there's any problem <laughs> because it's a, there's a complete disconnect and you can exist in a pump bubble. And I can say as an editor myself that in this whole period, all the stories that we've had from freelance journalists that talk about nice things like arts or business, a positive business story, a little entrepreneur who's had a success, has been put on hold. It's very difficult, I think, as you also probably realise, Matthew, it's very hard to run Lee's kind of positive stories or about, you know, ordinary things when you know that there's a... Say something. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Because I don't think writing about business is, like, nice necessarily. Um, no, I'm saying if there's a positive story. Right, but I'm... So, uh, so when, I, when I was talking about business, I was, I was thinking about... The, the danger of a banking crisis, which is very real in Myanmar right now, um, whether they can sustain the economy at the current rate. I mean, things that are going to affect overall stability yeah. in the country, and it's not a positive story. No, My I agree, but that's that a serious to, story. We have to cover, yeah. it's, it's, you can get I that in. I'm just that. saying that yeah. it's difficult to get a positive story on Myanmar in when, yeah, and you feel bad as well, because the scale of what's happened, as Jonathan said, is so big, but you cannot just run those stories every day, all day. And I so totally agree with John where he says we have to listen to the other side, however unreasonable it might, be, might seem, and we have to echo their views. This is, this is news. I mean, this is part of the dynamic in Myanmar, which is that a large part of uh, 50, 50, 55 million people simply don't believe anything that the Western media is reporting, and they think that their country is being unfairly picked on. Now, however unreasonable we think that is, we do have to reflect it but it doesn't mean it gets equal weight. No. But there is also the, the point which John made that the government, you're trying to seek comment from the government and they, they don't r to return your calls, they don't return your emails, they literally hang up on you when you're asking, in the middle of an asking a question. Um, so it can, be, it can be very difficult to, to actually get that side. And if you're trying to speak to, you know, if you're in Rakhine and, and trying to speak to Rakhine, there, is, uh, there has been very, very serious security issues with, with people with journalists um, being threatened with violence. So it's, yeah, th these things are, there's a big, there's a lot of challenges with getting that side across. But yeah. I, we certainly have to, we, we certainly have to try to make sure that mm -hmm. we are always getting that across. And even where the, even where the spokesperson or the isn't available to be able to give the, the sort of full account, to then make sure that we at least try and present the side of the, their mm -hmm. side, that side of the argument as well as we can to ensure that we are always giving the different points of view um, in, 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 in all our coverage um, and, and even to, to sort of help to make sure that that point of view comes across um, even if we're not able to get the specific comment. Thank you. Well, let's hear from the audience if anyone has a question. Um, please come to, there's a microphone up there. Please identify yourself and either address it Generally, or to a specific person. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, I can please change the sound. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, my name's Jeffrey Goddard. I worked in Myanmar for 13 years as a journalist, mainly at Myanmar Times, but also at uh, Mizima in Frontier, in Frontier Myanmar. Um, I could talk to you about glass walls of misunderstanding in Yang Kong newsrooms after 200 after 2012, but that's not what I'm. That's not the question I want to ask. Um, I've got a question for John Reid. Um, good piece, but I'm wondering why you didn't touch on backsliding at the Myanmar Times, particularly the sacking of Fiona McGregor at the government's behest because she reported allegations that the Tupmador had raped 30 women in a village in northern Rakhine. Yeah, thank you. Good question. And there's no sinister reason for that. In particular, it was space reasons. It was 5,000 words, and I left a lot of interesting stuff out. But yes, it's a, it's a shocking case. Um, it's been happening. I mentioned that it's been happening. Similar arguments have been happening in other newsrooms. I mean, Myanmar Times is one of them. That story was very well told by, I think, Sean Gleason. Um, yeah, so, but yes, it's absolutely, it's part of the story. I didn't tell Jonathan's story either, which is part of the same thing. I had to, I had to pick and choose. Maybe you should do a book, John. <laughs> Not about this, but. <laughs> Hi, um, George McLeod. Um, what, what sort of access, if any, have you gotten to uh, 
Rohingya militants, uh, I believe it's called ARSA, uh, to, you know, uh, individual militants or training camps in Bangladesh. Thank you. Well, <coughs> I think... Jonathan, would you like to... Well, I'll, I'll, I mean, I've training camps, that's... Uh, there's a good story to be told. Um, I, for reasons the way the BBC works, um, we, we have the BBC's carved up into empires. Um, and my empire ends at the Naf River, technically. Um, I'm not supposed to cross because Bangladesh is mostly covered by my colleagues coming down from Delhi. Uh, we have an office in, in uh, Dakar as well. I, I, so I've only actually been to Bangladesh once. And in fact, when I went there, which was, I was the, what they call the second wave. So the first wave of reporters who went in after the crisis began were very much dealing with the enormous human horror and humanitarian, sort of just these people swarming across. By the time I went and I'd already been in Rakhine State by then and seen that side of things, uh, one of my focuses actually was to try to find people from the village where I'd seen court Rakhine Buddhists burning the village down, which was an important story. But one of the things I did try to do was meet people from Asa. <coughs> it's pretty difficult. Um, you know, you, you walk around the camps, if you just start saying, you know, is anyone here from Asa? Half of them <laughs> put their hands up. <coughs> it took me the um, best part of a week with some very, very good local g people I, I knew who have lived there. They're, they're from the Cox's Bazaar area and they know the Rohingya communities very well. Uh, and they needed to cross-check people coming forward. We ended up talking to two people, one of whom was clearly a kind of a bit of a hanger-on. He wasn't really deeply involved, but the other guy had been involved in Asa um, for so between two to three years. Um, and he described the processes of how the influence had grown, how they set up these training very basic training camps in the hills away from the villages and how they would seek the support of the villages. Um, and so a lot of it, depending on the village, the young men would go up and volunteer to stay out there and learn basic bomb making. They made bombs out of old uh, car engines or truck engines. Um, and, you know, then he described the preparations, which apparently were pretty hasty. It was a pretty rushed job for the 25th of August attacks. But I didn't get any further than that. Um, what I know is that the, the, the ba Bangladesh has been, uh, the Bangladesh authorities have been deeply involved in monitoring that border and, and monitoring the trouble from that border, obviously, pretty much since Bangladesh has been a state. So the border guards, and particularly Bangladeshi intelligence who operate there, know Arthur very well. If there are training camps, which we think there probably are, um, in sort of away from the, the camps, certainly Arthur's, by the way, Arthur's influence in the camps in places like Kutapalong is very big. Um, everyone knows them. Um, opinion is mixed. I met plenty of Rohingyas who had fled their villages who were ex really angry with us and blamed them, and some of whom had rejected their influence. But certainly there are some kind of training camps there. There was an attack in January um, on a Burmese mm. Myanmar military convoy up in the north at northern Mongdor, which almost certainly was a team that came across the border. Now, if that's happening, the, the Bangladesh, they won't, Bangladesh won't obviously publicly acknowledge this, but there must be some quiet, tacit acceptance of that by the local Bangladesh security forces. Uh, how far they'll allow that to go happen, I think, will depend a great deal on how they want to manage their relations with Myanmar. Um, Bangladesh, understandably, is extremely unhappy at the moment about the way that the Myanmar military has, has operated. Uh, I don't think it's a little unfair to ask other people. Well, you've been in there, haven't you? Yeah, probably, so I you mean, know. again, I would say that it's, <laughs> if you meet people saying they're from Asa, it's, it's again, it's very difficult to verify that they are actually from the organization. Um, as Jonathan said, you, you get people, you might get people claiming certain things and it's not, not actually true. Um, so it's not as if you can sort of call up the head of Arthur and say, look, are these guys yours or not? Um, so, so there's a lot of, you have to exercise a lot of caution there. Um, but again, you know, I heard speculation among Bangladeshi journalists that that there's tacit acceptance on the Bangladesh side. But then there's, it's, Cox's Bazaar is absolutely full of rumor and, um, you know, there's this kind of, I think it's similar to Pakistan. There's a lot of, people like to sort of tell tales about what's going on and who might be behind it. And it's, it's really hard to sort of cut through that and, and find out what's actually going on. Um, I might add that, uh I do know in the, um, in the, it does seem like, well, we haven't heard from Asa for some time in terms of attacks, but uh, 
Uh, meanwhile, so they may be annihilated, they may be alive and well, and as you suggest, um, Jonathan, right through the camps, uh, as you say, they do have some support. Mm -hmm. But this is another layer, I think, uh, of um, dilemmas that Western journalists have to deal with because ASA knows where its constituency is and it's not going to get play in Myanmar media. And so, you know, there's a lot of talk about how they can contact journalists on Skype and they've given various interviews. So there's a lot of spin coming out of Malaysia. Uh, they've, you know, developed some spokespeople, I think, who are quite articulate. Um, whether they really exist in force or not is another question. So I think that is also um, an almost a, a very difficult dilemma for journalists, I think, is to how do you deal with this group? Usually if you're covering an insurgency or the Kachin, you know, the Kachin um, army, you know broadly what you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there must be an issue for journalists in, in knowing how to deal with ASA. I don't know if anyone has a... I just wanted to say in terms of two sides to the story, I mean, not to detract from the humanitarian emergency or ethnic cleansing or whatever you want to call it, is that I think we need to take seriously the possibility um, that ARSA will emerge as an actual fighting force, that they're going to be um, a party to a conflict in the future. I mean, this is how the Palestinians started in the 50s. I just think we need to hold that in our minds. We don't need to prejudge, but we should the report on our stuff. For the, the Palestinian um, pr pr parallel was one that was so obvious to all of us when we were sitting in Bangladesh, seeing this tide of people coming across who quite obviously are never going to be able to go back home, who are stateless, have nowhere else to go, and of course are prey to extremism, jihadism, because what else have they got? Um, it was, it's a very obvious worry. Um, and it's like the, southern Lebanon. The, the parallels are very, very sharp. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I've got another yeah. question. Um, this time for Matthew Kostovan, um about the disgraceful setup arrest of your two colleagues. Sorry, can you speak up, Jeffrey? We couldn't oh hear I'm you. I'm speaking as loud as I, I can. I couldn't hear you. Okay, well, perhaps there's something wrong with the sound system. Um, okay, that's better. A question for Matthew Kostovan, uh about the disgraceful setup of your two colleagues. Do you think their case was helped by Bill Richardson's comment in America before he left for Myanmar to be involved in that discredited panel? Do you think their case was helped by him saying he was going to see the Home Minister and get them released and his subsequent behaviour after he arrived in Myanmar? Um, I, I wouldn't want to go into details of that and com couldn't comment on that, but what I could say is, 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 is just how important has been the... Uh, immense support that there's been for Walon and Chosuwu um, from around the world, um, from from people here, lots of people here as well, um, in in supporting them, in making clear to the uh, to, to the world that they're watching, that they're following this case, that they're listening to what's going on, um, that they care about what's happening, that they care about their case, that they care about press freedom in 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 Myanmar. Um, I mean, I have to, I should thank the, the, the FCCT as well, as well as, uh, I mean, the, uh, on their behalf, frankly, as, as, as well as journalist groups around the region and, and, and lots of people, lots of people who are here who've, who've really provided that support, which, which not only, we hope, does help their case, but which also helps them in showing them um, in their detention, just how much attention it's got, just how much people outside care about them and care about supporting them and care about them being released so that they can get back to their young families and, and get back to their jobs. Thank you. Please. I have two questions. Uh, one is to Mr. Reed specifically, and the other one is to the panel. Mr. Reed, you, in your initial comments, you, could you clarify, elaborate? Sorry, could you just identify yourself? Sorry, my name is Singming Shaw. I'm from Hong Kong. I write columns uh, for Project Syndicate. Um, you mentioned that reporters should probably take into more consideration of the bigger context in which the stories have been taking place. Um, I don't know what that means. It, I would be, I'd be very grateful if you could clarify that. The question to the panel, a number of you mentioned 
the fact that, in fact, the majority of the population uh, don't seem to believe in the stories uh, written up by the so-called Western press. To me, that's a very big story, and I don't understand it, because if I could refer you to the Chinese case, most people would believe exactly the opposite of what the government's been saying. So if the government says the sun rises <laughs> from the east, they say, no, 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 it's got to be from the west. I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but for a country like Myanmar, that, that has been living under a military dictatorship for as long as I can remember, I would have thought something similar would have taken place. And in fact, based on what I've been hearing from you and from other reports I've read, nothing remotely of, uh, uh, to, to that has taken place. And I, I thought that uh, I would get some, some enlightenment from this panel as to why you think that right. is the case. Okay, so the first question may be to John, but I think au contraire, <laughs> one should bear in mind that the military have become heroes out of all this, in fact, absolute heroes. Anyway. Ex excellent John. question. Um, I think there's a, a broader context around the democratic uh, transition in Burma that gets left out of stories. I, w I felt like I was, I didn't go to the camps, I didn't, didn't write any of the pure Rohingya stories, that they were sort of denuded of context of why this is happening in Myanmar right now. People wrote very well about the um, cultural context, about racism, um, anti-Muslim sentiment, the history of Muslims in Myanmar, that's been, been covered very well, but that part wasn't covered as well. Um, I also feel like when people went to, um, I'm pointing at Jonathan, but <laughs> I don't mean Jonathan, when any reporters went to Rakhine, they were kind of so worried and, and so focused on one thing that they didn't look at the, um, the broader ethnic conflict there about the Rakhine minority, which is sort of, I guess, the third party to this conflict. It's the Rohingyas and then the Rakhines who have their own grievances in the government. And also the economic backdrop. I mean, it's a desperately poor, um, pretty awful place to live. And um, I mean, again, this is down to also not getting access to these people or being threatened by them if you try and interview them. I think you did interview Yeah, I mean, I, uh, on that point, if you go to Sitway, and then Poppy will bear me out on this because she's, she's alluded to that. Sitway is a place where the Rohingya population was, and I, I use the word because this is what happened, ethnically cleansed out of Sitway in the first serious bout of violence in 2012. And the population, the Rakhine Buddhist population, is very defensive. Um, ex and they've seen far more Westerners than other parts of Rakhine, particularly a lot of aid agencies who they believe are rushing lots of help to the Rohingyas who were stuck in camp, miserable camps, giving nothing to the Rakhine. It's a very bitter place and it's very hostile. I actually recently went to Mrak U, largely because it's the only part of Rakhine State we're allowed to go to now because tourists go there, but it is also seen as the kind of emotional heartland of Rakhine nationalism, and it was very interesting to get a very different point of view, and you do have a sense of a population which has its, its historic grievances. Um, to address two of the points that you made in that, in that question, um, absolutely history is vital. I mean, I, I mean, you cannot start to understand why Burmese people feel the way they do without looking at its very, very painful history. And Myanmar has an extremely tor tormented history that way beyond the, the struggles of other Southeast Asian countries and a very unhappy history of British colonialism. Uh, and I was, I remember when I was in Rauku, the, the Rakhines were saying to me, please tell the world it was you British who brought <laughs> these bloody Bengalis here. And I said, yeah, I mean, to a large extent that's true. We also brought the Chinese to Singapore and to Malaysia. Um, you know, you can't send people back who came 150 years ago. You know, you accepted your borders at independence in 1948, but the, 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 that real feeling was there. On the reasons why there's been so much, you point, you know, why people get siding with the government, I've just put one factor, and it's Aung San Suu Kyi. Remember how many people voted for her in 2015. Remember how much hope has been invested in her. She, I mean, she is a she's almost godlike figure in, in Myanmar. She's seen as the savior of the country. And part of the reason they, they love, there are many reasons, but one is, of course, that she was so esteemed overseas. You know, Burma has, or Myanmar has been a pariah state, backward, uh, under sanctions, with a hated military. But they had this one figure who the whole world adored. And we all turned on her. We all pointed the finger at her, that she's tolerating ethnic cleansing. A lot of the outrage you're seeing in public opinion is from people who aren't necessarily that anti-Muslim or necessarily that pro-military. They are pro-Aung San Suu Kyi and they're appalled that we have turned on her. Mm. Yeah, I mean, 
it's been quite, I mean, it's been quite shocking to, to kind of witness that transformation from suspicion and, and hatred of the military to kind of adoration in a lot of cases. But uh, something that's been mentioned a lot recently is um, the role of social media. And it's become this kind of echo chamber that you know, I think that there are, there is this silent minority which, which has a lot of doubts, who have a lot of doubts about what's going on, who, who, who don't necessarily agree with the majority, but they're sort of bombarded with these with hateful messages on Facebook they it, yes yeah, it's, it's a kind of an echo chamber so and there's a lot of vitriol targeted towards those who do kind of speak out who do say something so it's, it's a very hostile climate to to this minority which I, I, I know exists you know I know some of some of the people who who could be speaking out um, you know it's, it's been quite disappointing or, or quite surprising in, in some cases that uh, some of the other um, ethnic groups who, who have been so long oppressed and they subject to some of the same abuses, um, w so they weren't very quick to kind of, they dismissed um, allegations coming from Rohingya where when they'd seen some of the same things happen in their own communities. Whether that was because they believed these things didn't happen or whether because they're afraid to speak out, it's, it's kind of unclear. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much, all of the speaker and who participant here tonight. And I am a victim of genocide. Um, could you just identify yourself, please? Yeah. yeah. This is Ajis Ismail, uh, living in Thailand, a Rohingya, uh, representative of Rohingya Peace Network of Thailand. Also, I am a victim of genocide. This is enough, enough, and enough for to call genocide against on Rohingya. My question is how we need to do to stop this genocide? This is first question. Then second is, uh, I, I would like to add that about ARSA, A-R-S-A, Rohingya uh, uh, Arkan Rohingya Salvation Army. By my information from ground, from my family, and from my relative, from my villager, and from my Rohingya brother and sister who live in inside of Arkan, the ARSA is not representative of our Rohingya people. This is organized, made, made by Burmese Army for to show international community the Rohingya people have an armed group or, the, uh, or, uh, or a, a, a terrorist. This is fake. Before ARSA, there is a old name, al Akin. al Akin also killed many, many Rohingya brother and sister, including my relative. We Rohingya never saw their face. They closed their face right. every time. So could you so please so tell us what so the question so is? So my question is, the ARSA, some of the uh, people here uh, in, uh, and representative here discussing about ARSA, who have the document or evidence of the ARSA base and headquarter or the training, et cetera? Sorry, Thank what you. was the question? Who are they? What's the, what's the evidence? Oh, okay, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll kick Thank off you. just because I did meet Sabil there. Look, um, I agree with you. It's um, the whole ASA issue is very murky. And um, one thing we do know is that the Myanmar military was certainly ready for the attacks on the 25th of August. They knew they had advance notice. Uh, whatever ASA is, it had been infiltrated. A great deal was known about it. Um, you know, what it is... We, you know, we have this one man, Atta Ullah, who makes these, these statements and we see them televised. It certainly it exists. Uh, who's running it? Yes, I'm sure it's infiltrated. Um, certainly, though, in a lot, of the, among a lot of the people I spoke to in Bangladesh, there was quite strong sympathy. Not necessarily because people were active members, but particularly among young men, they just said, well, thank God somebody's actually finally um, doing something, taking some action. Um, so, I mean, you're right to be s suspicious. I don't think it's a necessarily a... Uh, uh, Burmese army creation, but I, they, they certainly know who they are. And it's worth remembering, you know, that the, the um, Myanmar government has 
has uh, designated Asa as a terrorist group and demonizes them as the, these shocking attacks on the, on the 25th of August. But far more Burmese soldiers have been killed by the Rakhine army, um, the Arakan army, um, in the last uh, three years than have been killed by Asa. Um, that is a well-armed group that uh, ambushes Burmese, like not, hasn't done much lately, but a couple of years ago was regularly ambushing Burmese army uh, patrols. And it's treated as just another ethnic army, not as a sort of, you know, this hated uh, group. So there's a, there's a very unfair demonization. As to your other question about the way forward, look, you know, call it a genocide, ethnic cleansing, whatever you like, you're right, something of that dreadful scale has happened. Sadly, the, you know, until you get China to change its view, um, nothing is going to happen internationally. And more realistically, you, know, you need to get the Myanmar government and the Myanmar people to change their view. Um, and that's going to be a very difficult job. There is no easy answer, and I'm afraid everyone involved in it will give you the same answer. Yeah, I think you're, yeah. you're referring to if, if it goes forward for any kind of um, uh, prosecution mm -hmm. or investigation, there, there can't be a prosecution at the International Criminal Unless Court. This is, this is a real prospect now. If the Min UN Line, Security it, Council it, it, it should happen. I mean, yeah. Min Aung Line, the armed forces commander, who is clearly the real power in Myanmar and clearly sees himself as a future president, um, under a, a different si situation, it should be up for a war crimes prosecution. There's very strong evidence of that. At least, you know, that he, he's, the, he's the chain of command goes up to him and his army... Um, to a large extent, planned and carried this thing out. Um, but it won't happen because it can't happen unless there's unanimity at the Security Council and neither China nor Russia will ever sign on to that, sadly. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, Michael? Thank you. Um, Michael I Mackey, freelance, not a great friend of editors, but let's talk about that later. <laughs> um, just this question about the saintliness of uh, Dorsu. Has anybody on the panel, either directly or through hearsay, come across um, editors, not in this region, you're off the hook, Gwen, but in London, in New York, in Singapore, who, one, don't really understand the significance of the story, and two, don't want to tackle it because they can't believe that, excuse me, Aung San Suu Kyi, could preside over something, which raises the issue of how do you explain and does an editor have time to comprehend that Aung San Suu Kyi might be the head of the government or very close to it, but really the army is a state within a state which has got to do what it likes? Well, that's the debate which I think any of us could answer about, you know, is Suu Kyi running the show or is she powerless? Well, and also yeah. the attitude. He, his question was really about Western editors. Well, and most, I must most, say, most editors you said yourself. Yeah, that and most, uh, most editors are profoundly shocked that this saint they once thought was a saint, she wasn't, but anyway, they thought she was, has suddenly turned out to be a, well, an apologist for ethnic cleansing. That's and the there's a lot of embarrassment about mm. Time magazine mm. covers and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, I suppose. But uh, well, again, I, mean, the, I don't think anybody probably fully appreciates how many honours Aung San Suu Kyi has had. I mean, I've got schools here in Bangkok calling me up, asking, saying, you know, we, we gave it, you know, we kind of named a library after her. What should we do? <laughs> you know, do we take it down? And I'm, I'm not convinced they should. I mean, I think they can. Um, the recognition Aung San Suu Kyi had was for extraordinary courage at a time where she was very courageous. The fact that she was stubborn and, you know, wouldn't listen to advice and was incredibly imperious. <laughs> All right, that was true too, but she was a very, very brave woman and she stood for something um, and she's now turned against that. I mean, does that mean you tear it down? I mean, the same arguments are being had about Cecil Rhodes and I suppose about General Lee as well in the States. But Kurt Waldheim. Let's, let's not go there. Yeah. I mean, okay. but, the, 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 uh, but the bigger one is obviously, you know, is Aung San Suu Kyi running the show or, or is, she, you know, is she a prisoner of the military? And that, frankly, you know, that debate goes on inside Myanmar itself. It goes on. The, the, the most extraordinary thing is you have a, a, a political system that is entirely dependent. I mean, leave the military out, and they really do run a lot of the show. Aside from that, everything hangs on this one woman. The NLD has always been like this. Everything's decided by her. Everyone else has to wait for her decision. And she's done what she used to do when she was under house arrest. She's gone into complete isolation. Nobody can get to her. The, the real problem in Myanmar at the moment is that, uh, you know, we've, you made this point about trying to call people up. You can't talk to anyone. Aung San Suu Kyi sets the tone, which is 
she's always done this. When she doesn't like something, she turns her, puts her nose in the air and turns her back on you and won't talk to you well, for years. If, if I may say, mm. though, I do think, mm. seriously, that Western media and, and mm. editors put pressure on journalists because the fixation has been on mm. Aung San Suu Kyi and, as you rightly said, to blame her mm. for everything. And we all know, and all journalists know, she cannot control but the Gwen, military. What so does that, does that, you know, give her an excuse? No, probably not. To choose to say nothing when you have a, right. a potentially historic crime against humanity right. going on under your own government exactly. is an astounding dereliction but of moral responsibility. But that is the crime, whereas I think Western media <laughs> has not also has not focused enough mm. on the as you say, the man who was responsible, who I think it. Burmese, it's one of the stories that Burmese people think we're missing, and um, I think they're right. I think it's very hard to get at, but I think it's worth asking, um, without detracting from anything Jonathan said, how much responsibility and power she had, how much in the loop she was, this may become very relevant one day, how much in the loop she was, and so on. Um, yeah. Perhaps this so is but the but perhaps the only power she has is the power that she's always had, which is her voice, and it's silent. Yes, and uh, maybe this is the last one, or we can take maybe one more after this, if anyone wants to ask a question. Uh, good evening. Good, uh, thank you very much, the panel, for discussing about Rohingya issue. My name is Jan. I'm a Burmese citizen. I'm uh, here in Bangkok, visiting here in Bangkok. All the Burmese citizens have noticed two things from the international media. One is the international media's accusation of genocide in Rakhine, and the other is the international media's shaming of Suu for being silent on the Rohingya issue. These two things all Burmese people have noticed. We, are, these majority Burmese people believe that international media are very biased. Interna they only show in the, the, in the example of other countries, they only show a, a dead body of a, a baby lying on the beach, and the other side, they show only the people raising their hand for a Nazi salute, racist. These kind of things for the international media, making their stories sensational. That majority of Burmese people feel that international people, international media are very biased and always trying to make their stories sensational, especially in the Rohingya issue. Um, no, they also want to, want international media to highlight the terrorist attack. It is a terrorist attack. Police outposts were, police uh, members were killed by, by cutting their throats in 10 police outposts in Rakhine while they are doing their own ju duties. Instead of uh, the only mentioning one side of the Rohingya uh, who are being tortured, killed, mm. and even genocide. Now the government is challenging the UN to prove give the clear evidence for the genocide. <laughs> and the... So uh, what is your question? My question is why the international, the, the people inside are seeing the international media. The people, not only the people inside, the people and the media, look at me like the, the lady said, that it's quite different between the international media's view and the local media and the local media's view. Why that happens? And the another question is, Suji silent on international media. There's a lot of huge amount of criticism on Suji for being silent on the issue, but I didn't see any media report why, what causes her to be silent on the issue. She mentioned once that she cannot take side in the conflict. If she takes side in the conflict, she, she won't be able to involve in any future negotiation in the in the communal conflict. So why uh, do you think? Suji has been silent on, on this issue. Right, thank you. And uh, may I just say also to the panel, we mustn't forget that she has made uh, at least two speeches in the last six months mm. on the issue, but they're not the sort of speeches that obviously, um, you know, fulfilled the kind of demands of Western media to explain why <laughs> or to accept responsibility. I think this question of, you know, why are we sensationalizing the crisis is interesting because this is, uh, there's no really doubt about it that this is a sensational event. I mean, 
a lot of local media. I mean, I, d I can't think of any many local journalists who have from Myanmar who have been to Bangladesh and have witnessed that side of the story. So, so I'd be really curious if, if um, you know, Myanmar Times or Eleven or any of those, wh why they haven't sent any anybody to Bangladesh. It seems like they they're kind of avoiding that side of the story, and then that's you know that's kind of an interesting interesting question. Um, as for her silence, uh, you know, as as you mentioned, this is this is a huge moral catastrophe, and and as somebody who who was you know put on a pedestal, but also also made you know she she was an icon, and she she channeled she channeled Gandhi. She um, you know she she was very deliberate about the way that she spoke. Um, so it's, it's, it's news, it's natural for us to be, for the West to, to find that more surprising than, than for example, Min An Lang and, and the Burmese army who, who have been doing these kind of things for years. It's, I think that this is the definition of, of what's newsworthy and what's not. And I I would okay, sorry, Matthew, yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I would just say that, I mean, it's, it's certainly not, it's certainly never our intention to, to sensationalize um, what we want to do is to be able to present the facts um, and to be able to present the facts that allow people to see the, the story, to allow people to see what's going on, which again is, is what my, my colleagues Wallone and, and Cho Soo is exactly what they were, they were trying to do. But one really critical thing here in being able to tell the story is being able to get to the story and is being able to have that access yeah. to, the, to the people, to the places where things are happening. Um, and, uh, and as we all know, that's, that's a real challenge. Um, and without that access, it's much harder to be able to tell um, the different sides of the story, to be able to, to, to give that this different perspective. Uh, and of course, referring back to my, my, my colleagues, it's exactly what they would be doing if they could, is trying to, to report on the story, not in a sensational way, um, but as, as Myanmar, as Burmese citizens who are a, 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 a sort of happy citizens of their country, um, to, be, um, to be able to sort of tell those facts. They can't because they're locked up and they can't because journalists are, are restricted and find it challenged to get to some of the areas where things are, where things are happening. And, and I think it's also important that we, that we recognize that. Well, can Thank we just, you, John? Uh, I want to just oh, to respond to the points that they, that, I mean, I'm very glad that you spoke. I'm, it's fantastic. We've actually got a Burmese voice here uh, and we're hearing those points of view and it, it, it's a very important part of the debate. Um, we have always reported the attacks on the 25th of yeah. August in detail. Mm. Um, in every one of our reports we refer to them. Um, if I'm not mistaken, 14 people died in those attacks, I think if we, uh, which I think 12 were government officials including police. Um, and nobody has downplayed them. Uh, people died and were killed, sometimes horribly. Um, the estimate that I think Medicine Sans Frontier came up with was something, bet a, a minimum of uh, close to 6,700 6, people killed by the military zone operations. The, the discrepancy is just too big to ignore. Nobody is saying police didn't die. We've always said that. But you can't make that the story when you have this wholesale, and I call it ethnic cleansing because if ethnic cleansing means anything, it's this. Genocide we don't use, certainly not the BBC, not many people. It's a very, very emotive word, and I used to live in Turkey where was a similarly emotive word. It's not one you use lightly. There is, in fact, a legal definition of genocide, which some have argued what's going on Rakhine might meet, but it, it's a legal debate. Not many media are saying it's genocide. It's not fair when it's not true. As far as Suu Kyi's reasons, yes, we've speculated a great deal. As she says nothing herself, and none of her ministers, and nobody will explain it, we're left guessing. And we have, in all our reporting, referred to the fact that her hands are tied by public opinion and that she has very little power in an area that's run essentially by the military. That's been acknowledged. Doesn't mean she can't speak out. Sorry, John. Uh, I was John, I just going to say, I was going to uh, underline what Jonathan said. Every single serious news story has mentioned the killing of, I think it was, yeah, 12 policemen, civilians mm -hmm. as well. There were 14 so officials in total. 14 think, yeah. One was in an all, immigration officer. Every serious news story has mm -hmm. mentioned that. And yes, we do in, try and figure out what's going on in, in Aung San Suu Kyi's um, head and, and her room for maneuver. And I think it's a big untold story what is actually happening, as which I was trying to suggest as well. We're doing our best. If you can't go to a kind state, mm -hmm. and this is the problem. It, and, and I would say to my Burmese friend, ask yourself this, why has the government denied access, not just to journalists, but to every reputable UN human rights 
investigator. The UN fact-finding team denied access. The UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights denied access. I mean, you couldn't look more guilty. Mm. You try and, you, you, and look at the, the situation in Indin. Until these courageous Reuters journalists actually investigated what was happening in Indin, the Myanmar military pronounced that it had investigated all the events inside Rakhine State, which nobody else was allowed to get involved in. They held this investigation entirely on their own. They'd spoken to loads of people and they weren't responsible for unlawfully killing anybody. Once the Reuters report came out, after they jailed the two journalists who were doing it, they then said, well, actually, yes, we did, ma we did actually make 10 people line up, dig their own grave and, and massacre them. Yeah, that probably wasn't right. They're not ending up to anything else. I mean, it, the weight of evidence is absolutely overwhelming, and I would urge all decent Burmese people, which is most of them, you know, it's, it's very, very uncomfortable to accept that these things may be carried out by your own government, your own armed forces. And I think all of us understand that. It's not an, a, a comfortable thing to accept. Um, but it has happened, and, it, and, and we won't move on until there's some acknowledgement of that. Thank you. Um, only short, short. Uh, no, well, <laughs> I think uh, there's yeah. one more person who wants to ask a question, but if you want to say one quick thing. No, only very, very short. If nothing hidden inside of Arkan, in our hometown, homeland. Why the Burmese army government block or deny the international community, researcher, reporter, including UN, UN face finding mission, why all are blocked by Burmese army government? I think there is inside of Arkan in our hometown, anything. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you for speaking up. Uh, and last question. Sorry, can you speak up in the, into the bit, microphone? Yeah. Uh, my name is Shino Pai, I'm an international relations student in uh, Thailand. Uh, my question is, uh, you talked about stakeholders uh, for this uh, specific topic, that we also should rely on NGOs, but also the United Nations. How does the United Nations support uh, journalism in this specific topic of today? Uh, would anyone like to answer that? Is, is anyone getting support from the United right, Nations? Yeah. <laughs> well, I do <laughs> notice that uh, actually, Today, uh, Guterres, the Secretary General, released a extremely strong, unusually strong statement uh, reacting to the Commander in Chief's recent amazing speech that uh, said that the whole Rakhine crisis was due to um, the Bengalis' uh, outrageous demands for citizenship, and it was all their fault because of that. But um, so that was, uh, I thought, uh, fairly strong on the part of the Secretary General. But do any of you <laughs> have a view? What, the, 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 how does the UN support journalists? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the UN uh, principles, that the, the Charter of Human Rights, uh, this is always an interesting point about journalists, is that, you know, yeah, we're neutral. But the one thing that we're not neutral about is freedom of speech, because we can't be. It's our business. Um, we have to stand up for freedom of speech. And actually, it's the one thing as a journalist that I speak out about. Um, I take a stand. You know, I, I support freedom of speech because if I didn't, I'd have to give up my job. Um, it, it, it's one of the human rights. Um, you, the UN Human Rights uh, Commission office has been, um, it's done a, 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 in many ways a tremendous job in trying to deal with human rights problems throughout this region and has been very supportive of journalists who face um, all sorts of sanctions and sometimes in the case of our Reuters colleagues even imprisonment um, and to that extent but they're not the only group there are plenty of human rights groups who do it and others as well um, you could argue the UN's values are our values but I wouldn't want to push that too far we're separate agencies they're doing their job we're doing ours some people would argue that in some situations the UN and journalists get too close and John has made the point you cannot just be dependent on an NGO, however worthy, uh, for their information. You have to rem keep a distance and get your own information. There's also the point that, you know, for, for years in Rakhine, NGOs, the UN, were so cagey about what they were doing there. And, and for some, you know, they were afraid they were going to get kicked out of Rakhine. So, so for those of us who were trying to cover it accurately, it was quite difficult, actually, to try and talk to the UN and to try and talk to NGOs because people wouldn't meet with us. They wouldn't even say things, you know, they might say, they might criticize a, a story, you know, a, a, in the local paper or whatever, and they'd say those those things are wrong. 
And then they wouldn't, you know, I'd say, oh, well, did you, did the journalist approach you? And then they'd say yes, and I'd say, what did you say? And they said, no comment. <laughs> you know, so it, talking to us is, is a really good, good start of, of, of helping. Uh, and, and, the UN, and the UN, from the Secretary General down, I mean, among many other groups, countries, um, have, been, have been very supportive, have spoken out for Wallon and Chosuru in their, in their detention. Um, and that's obviously something that they and, and we're grateful for. I think also I can say from covering over eight years, I've had um, quite good access to UN agencies and also in SITWAYS. So perhaps, Bobby, it depends which agency you go it for because some are better yes, than yeah. others. No, no, definitely, yeah. yeah. And if you're talking to uh, agencies like WHO or UNICEF, mm. they've got a real interest in getting out information about you know, the situation with children or, you know, um, whatever, you know, illnesses or health. Mm. Um, so perhaps they're the more um, accessible agencies. Mm. But overall, I don't think there's a policy that says help journalists <laughs> by the UN. Um, so on that note, uh, I'd like there's to... One more there's one more question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. One more? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Go on. You waited a long time. Thank Sorry, you. I didn't see you. No, it's fine. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Wei Wei and a Rohingya. Uh, I have one comment and one question. The first comment is related to um, the anti-foreign media sentiment as uh, Burmese colleague has presented and how to bridge that gap between the local media and Burmese media plus how do you really reduce this anti-foreign media prejudice or, you know, the, the the sentiment itself. I think uh, you can do three things. My comment is, uh, for example, like, um, I mean, as John has mentioned, uh, you know, comprehensive coverage is very important um, in terms of uh, within the Rakhine state, com comprehensive coverage of like all perspective, e economy, and the communal conflict itself and nature of religious conf uh, version uh, aspect of the conflict. On the other hand, the whole of Burma transition, and as we may, as you may all know that uh, the freedom of expressions and all other, when it comes to rights and freedom, all other aspects of uh, the rights has been uh, deteriorating over the five years, even since 2011 mm -hmm. of political transition. Uh, so this is very important, you know, how much our coverage has been uh, happening. I mean, it has been on the media at this, day, at this point uh, uh, because of the uh, writers, journalists, uh, but it is, it is, I mean, for, 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 for some while it has not been very com covered. And um, also about the conflict in other part of the country, for example, a conflict in, uh, intensifying in Kachin State, Sh Northern Shan State, and even Karan State, and they've been actually using the similar pattern and, and um, like similar kind of like you know uh, abuses has been ongoing or like basically targeting most of the time targeting targeting the civilians and villages. Um, so which is very important to really cover so that Burmese majority came to understand what's happening in Rakhine State is not, an, um, um, it's not something unique uh, or exclusive. It's been similar sort of uh, things happening in other part of the country and they may realize this is true so that you know, the prejudice can reduce a little bit. And two other thing is oh. like, how do you, um, sorry. <laughs> uh, one thing is I think actually uh, you, I mean, the international um, uh, journalist has to really engage with the local journalists, and mainly when the, there is like um, there are we have like journalism trainings and network and all this stuff. Maybe I would encourage to to really engage with them more effectively, and and get involved in their trainings and you know like uh, make them friends. And at the same time, there are. Like we have to really build, uh, create more Wallong and more Joso, more Esta and more other Burmese, you know, friends of you, basically who have integrity, you know, who have courage and who stand non-biased principle. So you have to really build them, bring them up with you, 
So I think this is three factors that you can put more effort to bridge that, uh, to, to bridge that gap. And so this is about the anti-foreign uh, uh, media uh, right. prejudice. Okay. Question. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> one what question one? left. <laughs> okay. Uh, can so you keep it very tight? Is it a short please? one? Yeah. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> you know, I'm a Rohingya, so I cannot stop speaking. <laughs> sorry about that. So, my question is, um, I mean, we've been really thankful for your intensive and co uh, consistent coverage of that issue. But the thing is, how much do you really go to the depth from the beginning? Let's say in 2012, there was rape case happened, and three guys were accused and they were put in jail. One guy as, uh, assassinated himself. So how much do you cover why this guy uh, suicide? Why this, this guy suicide? And what happened with these three guys? Were they really uh, like rapists and kill? Uh, are they really the, uh, the criminal? Or how do, you, how do you go deeper to that? Can, can I just okay, come in on thanks. that? Because yeah. it's a very good point. I, what you have to remember, all of us, and I, Poppy made this point earlier, we are a bit remiss in not having a Burmese journalist here. It's, it's not easy in, in Thailand because... Uh, and we I was tried. So <laughs> we did try, and I'm, I'm, I'm very glad to hear your voices. We are foreign journalists. Um, ultimately, our responsibility is not to get involved in a debate in a country, but to reflect that debate. Uh, and we can't do it in great detail. I mean, your point about you know how much detail do we go into, actually, I'd imagine... Most of us here have read in, in enormous depth about these events, the 2012 events, which I also covered. Um, and I know exactly about the case you're talking about. But there's not a lot of room in our own media outlets for, right. for that kind of detail. When I do a TV story for the main BBC domestic bulletin, it might be three or four minutes long. Mm -hmm. um, I can write longer pieces for the website. Right. You're, you're asking for the kind of detailed research which actually does need to be done by right. Burmese journalists who have a stake right. in that story. Right. No, I'm not blaming here. Mm. I just want to highlight, uh, you know, some of this stuff that could be done, you know, whatever way you can. Or mm. even, I mean, try to put, like, raise questions or put up the need for these things so that people have more, clar uh, you know, clarity on what's happened. And, like, for example, let's say also uh, when it comes to ethical uh, <coughs> journalism by the, you know, even, even by the foreign media uh, and, and journalists, uh, you know, we understand that there is professionality of, of the, uh, I mean, the nature of the, uh, your work, but on the other hand, how do you really, p uh, like, put up the ethic in terms of not to make, not to put more vulnerability to the victims or to the people who have suffered? For example, right. uh, yeah, thank you. Would any of you have a comment on that, those points? Uh, John, you talked about this. Um, uh, you might want to talk about the divide between uh, the Myanmar media and the Western media, since that was the focus of your piece. Yeah, I think I just wanted to, I think Waiwai Nu made an excellent point um, that raises a bigger point about engaging with Myanmar journalists, including those who might or might not be friendly to us, those who might, might or might not like us. I think this is getting lost now, and um, I will generally defend the Western foreign media coverage of the crisis in Myanmar. I think it's been mostly, mostly pretty good, with some exceptions. Um, but I think something's getting lost. I think um, as a result, we're kind of losing human-to-human uh, -human ties with people in Burma. There's ways we could engage with journalists and with journalism there more. Um, that's one idea why my new had. I'd like to hear more. Uh, well, just one other thing. I'm, I'm, I'm always very conscious um, in Myanmar of being a British journalist uh, and of Britain's history there and of the fact that, you know, we are Westerners who in the past people would have kind of accused of being, and it, rightly so in many cases, of being rather superior and yep. imposing their values. Uh, and I think we have to be extremely careful I mean, I will always remind people that you know the UN Charter for Human Rights is there, and it's been signed by every member of the UN. So, you know that these are not just Western values, sure. but you know we do have to be very careful that we're not seen as coming from outside and somehow imposing our values. That we're listening, uh, and that we take on board that there is a local context. But that only goes so far. Um, you know what's happened in Rakhine State has victimized horribly an entire population. It, it's not in completely black and white. Uh, there are always more subtle shades, but something, when something that terrible has happened, 
you can't kind of stand back and say, well, you know, it, it, it's local values, it's Burmese values. You can't take that kind of detachment. There are universal values, and they are more or less publicly accepted by governments, and we broadly reflect those as journalists. But, yeah, uh, an understanding that we, we can't be seen to be lecturing or preaching or coming with superior values is incredibly important. Thanks, Jonathan. And uh, with that, I'd really like to give a big thanks to the panel, who I thought were outstanding. <laughs> and thanks to all of you. It, it's been a great audience and really good questions. And uh, um, I hope we've um, taken the issue forward a little bit. <laughs> um, thanks very much. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay.